So today um, I want to talk about uh, um, the way in which uh, I, I write my music as a composer and how this is inspired or guided by some general principles of uh, complexity science uh, and network theory. And before we go and discussing more specifically one piece of mind that I would like to share with you, uh, I think it's necessary to give you a little bit of a background. And so this is, as in a journal club, I want to kind of discuss very briefly two papers of mine that lay out uh, the foundations for this approach. The first paper uh, is called Topology of Networks in Generalized Musical Spaces and was published uh, two years ago, I think, on the Leonardo Music Journal. And there I, for the first time, introduced this concept of uh, uh, network representation of a musical space. And what I mean by musical space is very general. A musical space can be uh, melodies, uh, it can be harmonies or chords, uh, it can be a rhythm, uh, it can be the way in which you put instruments together, the orchestration, or even the quality of the sound, timbre. Now, most of the work, the theoretical work uh, uh, that is discussed in this paper deals with harmony, uh, because it's been always a fascination of mine since I was a child and I was studying music theory, um, how we combine uh, notes uh, uh, to create different chords. And through these different chords, how we stack them together in a chord progression that makes our songs. And so how um, the, the combination of these chords uh, uh, generates uh, a, a musical composition. And in this paper, I start from a very kind of a beginning uh, um, uh, up starting point. I mean, uh, basically, we in music deal with uh, notes or in particular pitches. So we have uh, our 12 pitches in, uh, in the classical uh, uh, Western music scale, the chromatic scale. And the idea is how we combine all these pitches, um, not just to create a melody, but to create chords. And uh, there are many ways you can do that. Of course, you have 12 different pitches that you can use uh, and you can you know, combinatorially explore all the combinations uh, of groups of notes. So you have you know, two note chords, uh, three note chords, four note chords, and so on. And you can build uh, a geometrical space around this if you um, interpret these individual um, occurrences of note combinations uh, as vectors. And so you can actually mathematically define uh, quantities, uh, um, vector quantities that correspond to a specific chord. And once you do that mathematically, you can immediately define uh, um, a metric, so it's a, a distance in this vector space that tells you how far chords are from each other. And with this, uh, you can construct uh, actually a network by connecting one to the other net, uh, chords that have a distance that you set at the very beginning. Uh, you can do this with distances. You can also do this by finding out what are the operations that you have to do on these vectors uh, to transform them one into the other. And so there is uh, a way of recognizing uh, um, how you can reproduce or, or, or represent uh, rather a, a, a chord progression. So how you go from, say, C major to D minor to, you know, your song. This is a huge space uh, because, I mean, these are all possibilities that you can construct. Um, it, it contains within it uh, basically all the possible rules, uh, if we can call them rules of music, classical music theory, because each uh, transition from one chord to another corresponds to an operation that is coded into our understanding of, say, tonal music, for instance. But it's not a composition yet. This is just an enumeration of possibilities. The composition comes when the composer extracts from this space uh, only the chords that they want to use uh, to compose. And, uh, and this is where 
out of this very deterministic uh, uh, network uh, that offers us all the possibilities that we can have uh, from where we can extract uh, uh, the, the, the progressions that we want in the song, where composition enters. And composition, in a way, is an emerging property of a network that from deterministic becomes complex. Bach chorals uh, are um, masterpieces uh, of uh, um, harmonic organization. So basically what we are hearing here is um, the, the embodiment uh, of what tonal harmony is. Uh, is this hierarchical structure where there are chords that are more important than others that define what we call the key. So when we say there is a song in C major, means that the C major chord is the one that gives us uh, um, the completion of the song, the, 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 the final resting place uh, for the music that we're hearing. And this is very typical uh, and uh, one of the um, um, characteristics, the fundamental characteristics of tonal harmony, that you have a center a center where you gravitate around, and this center is what gives you the quality of the song. C major, C minor, major chords are, you know, what we always say, happy chords, and minor chords are the sad chords, and so on. And these are all organized in music theory uh, with very, you know, strict rules in a way. And what we are seeing in this uh, representation of the chorale is uh, a translation, if you want, uh, of these rules, uh, these rules of, that tells us what is the ordering of the chords in order to finish uh, a, a product uh, that is meaningful uh, for our ears, uh, um, that emerge from a geometrical structure and from an analysis that is not based on, uh, on uh, say, human intervention or human knowledge, but is based on the analysis of the topology of the network uh, that represents this composition. So what we just listened to is a representation of a very classical composition, is one of the chorales from Bach Corpus, Jan Sebastian Bach Corpus, um, that is represented as a network. And you saw how the, 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 the piece, the, the, the performance, uh, explores all the nodes and all the links in this network uh, um, to produce the final result. Now, there are a few interesting things that uh, we need to notice here before we uh, kind of proceed with a higher level interpretation of that. But one is, uh, uh, you probably noticed that the, um, the different nodes in this network have different colors, and the colors actually are not decided by me or by a human. The colors are decided by an algorithm that evaluates uh, the modularity classes. That means a mo measure of uh, how the nodes kind of belong to the same community within the network. And uh, um, I mean, surprisingly to me at the beginning of this study, these modularity classes uh, correspond almost exactly to the different keys, uh, so the different harmonic regions that are explored uh, within this chorale. So this interpretation it's not just uh, a geometrical representation of the piece, but gives us a, a very deep insight also on the components, the fundamental components of the composition, like which chords uh, connects to which other chord uh, and how they belong to the same kind of sonority in terms uh, of the musical expression. This leads to the second paper that was published uh, um, last year. Uh, on the Journal of Mathematics and Music. And the title of this paper is Tonal Harmony and the Topology of Dynamical Score Networks. And here, what I do, I uh, dive deeper into this uh, network representation of a composition and uh, um, extract more 
qual, qual, uh, quantities, I mean, more qualitative interpretation and quantitative interpretation of the composition out of this uh, decomposition of the piece in terms uh, of, of a network. So uh, in this uh, um, image that you have uh, um, uh, from this paper, you see now that the network uh, is not just a flat uh, kind of combination of uh, uh, circles and, 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 and segments, uh, nodes and links, uh, but it becomes multidimensional. Here we are actually separating uh, within a, one of the quartets of Ludwig van Beethoven the harmonic regions in an in almost exact way. So it, this opens up a whole host of possibilities in using the statistical mechanics-based uh, ideas uh, of networks and complexity to have a, an analysis of this piece that is basically automatic because there is no human input here. These are all algorithms based on network science, uh, analysis of time series, uh, um, complexity measurements, and so on. So what I gave you so far, though, is a very kind of horizontal, flat uh, picture of what music is. But music is more than that. It's more than you know, a collection of chords or vectors. Uh, or, or even progressions uh, or, or, or you know, individual agents uh, that produce uh, a composition. So music uh, is multidimensional and there is no uh, one place where you can say, oh, this is music or that is music. You see in this diagram uh, that uh, uh, my kind of, of framework uh, for my artistic practice, for my compositional practice, uh, where I see the, the whole process of creating music as a series of uh, basically steps uh, of information transfer between agents. And you see here, for instance, that I, I mean, in a way, I start from the composer, from the mind of the composer that with his experience, uh, their experience, their backgrounds, uh, they conceive a piece uh, and then they have to encode the piece into a score. And that's the first uh, kind of step in this information transfer dynamics. Uh, and then from this encoding comes the decoding that is done by the performer that needs to read the score and understand what the symbols mean in terms of what do I do with my instruments or with my voice uh, to interpret the symbols. And then there you go to the performance that is an encoding of this understanding of the symbols into an actual musical production act. There is an extra step if you want here. I mean, you have to play your instruments. You have an encoding of, you know, how your fingers have to move on, on the instruments in order to produce that particular sound. And from the performance goes to the decoding of the listener as, uh, or the performer itself, uh, um, or the composer itself. Uh, and then from there, this is decoded again through what we feel or what we understand of the music. And so our aesthetic or our emotion response to the music itself. Now, this whole process is noisy in a Shannon sense. I mean, there is noise at, at each step of this encoding and decoding chain. Uh, and Western performance practice uh, uh, pushes to the minimization of this noise. You really want to have on your final product on some fixed media, being that a CD or a digital file, the performance of the piece, how the composer has envisioned the piece to be performed. In my practice, I see the noise as the central part of the composition. You can use noise in, in the sense that you can manipulate the, 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 the piece in ways that involve not just the composer, but the performer and the audience at the same time. And so what I'm interesting, interested here is the interaction between these agents, being those, you know, even the symbols on paper or the audience members or the performers in the ensemble, how this interaction shapes the product, the final product, the result, what we hear, what we, what we feel. And this is the emergence aspect of these interactions. And the way in which I exploit this 
is by using uh, feedback loops at every step of this process. So the composer writes a score, but the score itself can be interpreted in many different ways. Uh, it can be produced by the composer in many different ways, so that there is no single score for, pe for a piece, but there may be many. And the same thing is the performer that reads the score and interprets it in ways that might not be conceived by the composer at the beginning, and so on and so forth. So that eventually the result of this process uh, is the emergence of, of an of a artwork uh, that is collective, uh, it's where everybody participates at some level in its production. At this point, I think we can listen uh, briefly to a piece of mine uh, that embodies uh, most of these ideas, not all of them, but most of them. Uh, this piece is called Requiem, and uh, uh, it's a piece conceived for an arbitrary ensemble. So you can have ensembles of any dimension, from an orchestra to a duo. It can be performed by people that are not musicians, and it's been performed by people that were not musicians. And, uh, and contains uh, all these feedback loops uh, uh, that I was talking about uh, at the level of uh, the conception of the idea, the representation on a score, the uh, performance of that score in a public settings. One, two, three, ten, seventeen, twenty-five, twenty-seven, fifty-six, sixty-nine, seventy-eight, ninety-six, ninety-eight, one hundred and forty-four, two hundred and thirty-nine, two hundred and fifty, three hundred and fifteen, three hundred and forty-eight. Four hundred and fifty two, four hundred and ninety three, seven hundred and seven, seven hundred and fourteen, seven hundred and fifteen, eight hundred and sixty one, nine hundred and ten, two hundred and ninety two, five hundred and seventy eight, six hundred and eighty five. Two thousand nine hundred and eighty three, four thousand and ninety four, four thousand two hundred and ninety four, six thousand six hundred and seventy nine, seven thousand four hundred and eighty nine, seven thousand five hundred and twenty two, seven thousand. Eight thousand eight hundred. 
two, three, ten, seventeen. Twenty, twenty-three, forty-one, forty-five, fifty-five, fifty-six, fifty-seven, sixty-five, seventy, eighty-four, ninety-two, ninety-seven, one hundred and sixty-six, one hundred and eighty-six, three hundred and ninety-eight, four hundred and ninety-eight, five hundred and sixty-one, five hundred and seventy-seven. Seven hundred and sixty-seven, nine hundred and seventy-five, nine hundred and seventy-five, one thousand two hundred and thirty-five, one thousand seven hundred. So this is what you are seeing now is uh, a page um, of the score as the performer of the the piece uh, sees uh, uh, during the performance. And you see here that the score is not traditional, it's actually made uh, of a network where each node contains uh, very specific instructions, uh, specific but very general instructions uh, on uh, some aspect of the sound uh, that the uh, performer should produce. Um, and it's very simple, I mean, register how high the sound is in pitch, uh, the, the speed at which the sound is played or the sequence of sounds are played, the, uh, the dynamics, how loud the sound or how soft the sound is, and then leaves even more freedom to the performer by adding another parameter uh, that is kind of the quality of the sound in a way that is either internal or external, and it is left to the free interpretation of whoever performs this piece. The difference between squares and, and circles is that the squares uh, are sounds produced by an instrument uh, and uh, circles are sound uh, produced by the voice. So in, principle, I mean, in practice, what happens is when the performer is on a circle node, um, he or she uh, they, they recite uh, the numbers. Now, the performance is completely open. The, uh, the, the performer starts uh, from any node on the score and uh, upon the cue of the conductor, and you might have noticed that I was kind of giving some gestures uh, to the performers, uh, upon those cues, uh, um, they go from one note to the next uh, that of their choice. So there is no predefined direction or, or, or circle or pathway that they have to follow, but they need to follow these arrows. Uh, in the in this uh, uh, in this representation, what you see at the bottom is the score that I was looking at as a conductor. That's where I know who starts when, I know who changes uh, from one note to another when, and uh, uh, basically puts together the performance in that way. It, it, the the performances are ever different. Uh, they are all very interesting, uh, um, and. Uh, and you see how these interactions between the agents uh, in the score, the agents as the performers, and the response of the audience uh, create a piece that is new every time. So to conclude, what is the takeaway out of here? I mean, 
uh, I showed you two aspects of my practice, the scientific, more scientific one that looks at music using you know, mathematics and physics, and the other one that looks at the artistic development of, uh, of, of an actual artistic product. And I think these two things are inherently connected. You can't really separate one from the other, at least in my practice. Um, I've always been fascinated by the underlying mathematical structure of music in many different levels. And the one that I just presented is one of them. Um, and there are more. Uh, there is a more abstract aspect of mathematics that, that, that enters into music through number theory and, and things that I, I don't use in my composition or, 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 or I, I, I'm conscious of them but not use them uh, um, in practice. Um, and from there, there is, you know, how all these mathematical tools can be used, not just at the level of the structure of music, but if you look at it more generally towards complex systems and, and complexity, then you have uh, the problem of, uh, you know, human interaction in the performance uh, uh, of an ensemble that can be represented, can be seen as a complex system problem and dynamics, or even more deeply uh, in your appreciation of music uh, in your brain. So how do we pro uh, process uh, the music information and how music affects us uh, at a deeper psychological and, and psychoacoustic and psychiatric and neurological level. And again, uh, we are talking about uh, a, a, a large number of complexity systems uh, and a lot of different techniques that can be applied to music uh, at different level and at different, uh, with different disciplines. So what I see is uh, um, this is kind of the beginning of a journey. Um, that I hope will le lead us to a better understanding of music within the evolution of humans, uh, evolution of animals, uh, and understanding ourselves.